Dudes, what's up? It's Trent Kanuga here with a new demo. I'm going to be talking about how to draw some Twilight Monk today. Yeah, I know you've been waiting. Let's start out with a rough layer. We're going to just sketch things in. We're going to get real sloppy with this. We're blocking in composition. We're blocking in the energy. We got some swooshy flow going here. Good angle on things. You'll notice things are moving from top right to top left. I'm cutting and pasting in some hairdos that I had previously planned and set aside uh, in a character style guide sheet. Uh, once we have our rough body worked out, our composition is in place, we've got flow from top right to bottom left, there's good energy going on, then what we do is we take that, we create a new layer, and uh, this layer is gonna be transparent, that's gonna be our inking layer, and we've got the layer below that uh, drop down to about 50% opacity, or lightened up. So basically that's just our rough sketch layer and what that's going to do is it's going to serve as our roadmap. That's our that's our architectural blueprint for the drawing. We've got everything worked out there at least in in, in its in its rough state in its in its chunky, sloppy, sketchy state. That could just be a silhouette. This is the beauty of digital. No penciling, no inking, it's one process. It is the same process. I'm using a brush that simulates a uh, kind of pencil effect, sort of, an ink effect. Uh, it does not have texture on it, although later I dig into some brushes that do. Uh, first things first, dude, you gotta put the mouse down. It's not a mouse and keyboard kind of process. To do this kind of art, you're gonna need some specialized tools. First thing I would recommend, get yourself a Wacom and 205. If you can find one, if you're on a super budget, get yourself a used in 203 on eBay. Dude, they're only like a hundred bucks, probably less. If you're handy, you can fix one up. I had it in 203 for 10 years. That's a lot of mileage, man. Like 10 years? What last 10 years? Anyways, uh, totally essential tools. There's a graphire, the, or I guess it's called the bamboo now. Um, anyway, it's a little bit more limited, but if you're on a tighter budget, uh, I think a, a brand new bamboo goes for about uh, about 100 bucks. Um, it's not gonna have the pressure sensitivity. Here's the biggest difference. It has pressure sensitivity, but it's not as robust or as deep as the Intuo series. So let's talk about this design a little bit more. Let's talk about like why am I doing this? What's the point? Um, I wanted to do a gallery type of a piece or a cover image. This is a new touchstone image. And what I mean by that is like, I wanted to reinvent what Mao is. I wanted to reinvent what people expect from Twilight Monk. There's an indie game in development. There's book three in development. I'm working out a long-term script for what's going to happen with it. And, you know, I wanted to really create some like imagery that would sell the character and sell the universe and sell the style. And so I wanted to encapsulate crazy awesome kung fu i wanted to encapsulate like cool angular type of dynamic action um the trinkets are representative of a character who's well traveled he's seen a lot of crazy stuff um and maybe like been a lot of places in this fantastic whimsical world what's he wearing like a weird sweater short sleeve sweater kind of a cloud looking thing <laughs> i don't know um I did the character design for Mao about 10 years ago, and for some reason back then, I drew him with this short sleeve sweater. I was into those. I used to wear those with leather pants. I know. Don't judge, man. I, it was a weird time for me. I was going to gothic clubs and uh, dating dominatrixes. It was a weird time. Anyway, uh, all that stuff informed my kung fu... <laughs> All that stuff informed my kung fu illustration techniques, and uh, and uh, one of the brushes that I've got here is actually a really nice textured brush, and it, it creates a very awesome kind of a paper uh, texture feel. But one of the things that I wanted to really address with this piece is the texture and material of all elements, and I wanted to work out the design of things at a much higher level. We're moving into a next generation of game development and that inspired me tremendously to up my game all across the board. Um, the character designs that I do now, 
way higher level of fidelity, way higher level of detail and thought put into every aspect of the character design. In some cases, you want some ancillary, unnecessary details, uh, elements that aren't necessarily... Uh, uh, they're not indicative, they don't encapsulate all of what the character is, but they're a small percentage. With character design, I like to think of things in the rule of thirds, so much with illustration as well, but specifically in terms of the concept of a character design, you want to have that distinct element that stands out. You know, in this case, Mao is clearly, he's got his, his kunai, his daggers. He's clearly like a martial artist. He's agile. He's well-traveled. You have all the trinkets. They're smaller. Uh, so the, the large imagery elements are somewhat in his proportions and his style. He's got the huge pants, the big hairdo. Okay, I've fallen back on that old trick before. If you read Creed, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but it worked. So uh, I, <laughs> I tend to try to uh, create characters that have very iconic elements that you immediately look at and go, oh, that's, that's Mao, or that's Creed, or that's, you know, uh, whatever it is. Even my take on Ghost Rider was very unique. And I'd rather get weird, I'd rather get unique, and really sort of chart un, uncharted, previously uncharted territory than to just go with something that's been done before. Now, don't get me wrong. I take inspiration. There's inspiration from Naruto. There's inspiration from Katsuya Terada. There's inspiration from Akihiko Yoshida. There's inspiration from Mike Mignola. There's inspiration from all kinds of, of other artists in the, in the I don't want to, you know, keep you up all night with the list, um, but all those things come together, absorb, you know, soak into artists. Even like Brahm is not necessarily my usual style, but I learned so much from studying Brahm's work. You know, all those things come together to help you form your own uh, your own toolbox of of skills and techniques and and styles that you can work in, and they they all lend themselves together. I'd like to think of myself as a pretty diverse artist, uh, having worked in the game industry for a while. you got to change styles a lot. So the purpose of a lot of these ropes and, and twine wrapping around him is to communicate that he's a well-traveled monk. He, uh, he has this satchel that he keeps st different stuff in, and I'd love to go in and like say, oh, he has these specific items in his satchel. You know, uh, large coins that are tied to strings, beads. Uh, from all over this fantastic, whimsical world. I'm really avoiding that that shoulder pad. I just don't want to design it because it scares me. Um, <laughs> I just know that I want for the character to feel more mature. I want him to have a unique silhouette. I want him to feel like he could defend as well as attack. And having cool shoulder or elbow pads specifically um, would be an interesting kind of a fighting style. The key to what Mao's fighting style is, is that he doesn't have one. He's, he's, he adapts to the moment, and that makes him very unpredictable. In this way, each of my characters is somewhat of a representation of an aspect of how I like to approach things, how I feel about things, what I am. And Mao is an aspect of myself that wants to remain completely unpredictable, uh, completely, I mean, he's heartfelt, he has great a great deal of sincerity, but he has a short attention span. He doesn't know all the rules. So when he doesn't know the rules, he makes them up. He's not competitive, but he hates to lose. So he'll do whatever it takes. If that means breaking the game, he'll break the game. Another thing I want to mention is that this kind of illustration is not my norm. None anymore. This is, uh, this is very much an illustration kind of a piece. And it's very gratuitous. How... Often do I get to sit down and spend this much time on one piece um, and, and actually make an illustration? It's very, very seldom. Uh, the d biggest differences between illustration and concept art is that concept art, which is my primary job, I've worked on Diablo, World of Warcraft, and presently on League of Legends, and what I do is concept art. That's my profession. Um, I seldom get to do illustration. The biggest difference, and you might be wondering, but dude, aren't they the same? I look at guys like, uh, uh, I don't want to say any names, but uh, there are a lot of guys out there that uh, you know people kind of think of as concept artists for game development, but they're more illustrators than anything else. And the biggest difference is this. Concept art 
is like a blueprint. You can't build a house without a blueprint. Uh, concept art is not flashy. It's not about the, the colors. Seldom is it as much about the colors or the painting technique as it is about the design, the intricacies of the design, the, uh, how the design functions, how the pieces are built, and it informs a 3D modeler enough to be able to construct it within a program such as Maya, ZBrush, or uh, any of the number of 3D packages that are used in game development or film. Illustration is a standalone image. It does not inform anything else other than the recipient's mind. And this is where it's a bit, it's a bit tricky. Um, I think in our, our industry, we get a little bit confused sometimes because it's really, some of these illustrations are very beautiful and they can act as a touchstone image or uh, a direction for mood and light uh, to design the, the look and feel, overall look and feel of a game. Uh, that's more of in line with what this image is. This is an illustration. If I were doing concept art, you would see the front, back, and side. The character might not be in as dynamic of a pose, you know? Now, admittedly, there's concept art in, in, in good illustration, and, you know, there's requires good illustration to communicate uh, uh, concept art. But illustration techniques are the language with which the idea is communicated. If you think about it that way, all of your techniques for illustration, such as rendering techniques and color theory and um, material definition and how lighting works, this is your vocabulary. The larger your vocabulary, the more articulate you can be with describing your idea with regards to concept art. And here, I'm finally going to do it. I'm finally going to face the 10,000 pound gorilla in this drawing and I'm going to tackle that shoulder pad, but not for too long, of course, because I'm still not sure about it. So I'm going to go back to doing some hatching. It's a good idea to just, if you're stuck on something, don't like keep beating your head against the wall on it. You know, take a break from that little spot, put in something that maybe kind of works and move on to something that you know will work. And you know, I don't want to get all life preachy or anything like that, but that's true of everything in your life. If you are frustrated as all hell and you just, every day you're, 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 you're facing something that's just impossible and, it, and, it, and you're causing crazy stress and you're, you're damaging relationships and all that just shit that happens in life is, is just bleh, you know? Uh, if it's if you're if you're working too hard at something, maybe it's not the right thing for you to be doing at that time. Maybe you got to take a break. Maybe go do something you're good at. Drawing should be fun. Making art should be fun. Now I'm not saying don't challenge yourself. You should always be challenging yourself. But if you're beating your head against the wall, just stop it. You masochist jerk. Just knock it off. <laughs> no, but seriously, stop. It's not healthy and it's going to impact you and your team and the people around you and it's just overall not good. Don't live like that. Uh, anyway, let's move back to what is working and what's going well. Uh, this piece, at this point, I think is still going pretty well. Things are going smooth. Uh, we got a little bit more outline happening around things. To I tend to do this, you know, I know it's a it's a bit of a crutch, and I have a lot of crutches that I use. You'll, if you're paying attention to a lot of my recent work, you'll see that I'm tackling a lot of the uh, the crutches that I've always fall, fallen back on, and that's a good idea to you know recognize self evaluation is so important to an artist. Um, I'm filling in some chunky areas to uh, to create a greater, easier read on on, on the whole image, uh, shading in some background elements to make sure that. Uh, you know, that back arm um, just reads as a hand. You don't need to see the details of it. You don't need to see every wrapping on the on his wrist or, or anything like that. Um, when it comes to these flowy chunks of cloth, they're mostly just there for energy. There's no real purpose. It's not in the character design itself. Um, it's really only there for the energy and the flow of the energy in the whole piece. Let's talk about Painter. A lot of people have some real problems with this program. My only problem with it is that it's a bit slower. Um, but there are a ton of really awesome things about Painter. Um, specifically, the digital watercolor tools. Digital watercolor is really nice at kind of creating uh, 
well, creating a textured kind of uh, watercolory effect, of course. Uh, that's what it was designed for, that's what it does well. Uh, Painter has some really easy tools for getting uh, paper textures and uh, keeping things feeling like they're working on a canvas type of a, a surface, you know. Uh, Photoshop is, is, was originally not designed to be a painting tool. It just happens to have the best uh, manipulation tools, so you can rotate canvas or cut, cut an element out and then paste it and then rotate it and skew it a lot easier than working with Painter. Painter can be sometimes really difficult, you know, um, and, and that's, you know, if the more time you spend with it, the more comfortable you get with it. Don't be afraid of a tool. If you see the, the long-term benefits of, of a tool, don't be afraid to spend the, the time to learn it and get comfortable with it. Uh, because as, as time goes on, you become very comfortable with it. When I first started using, when I first started painting, I was painting in Illustrator. And if you know much about this stuff, Illustrator is a vector-based uh, color tool. It's, it's more used for graphic design. You cut out chunks of, uh, of, of objects and then you slice them and you shape them. And uh, it was really not great for painting. You're using gradients. Uh, it's essentially it creates rather than create a line of pixels or raster pixels it would create two points and then it would calculate the the, the line between them rather than draw the line in pixels um, but I saw a lot of benefit from that and uh, ultimately when I did get more comfortable with Photoshop I, spending every day in Photoshop you get very comfortable with it it's like wearing clothes. You know how they're going to fit. You know exactly how that shirt fits when you're having one of those days where it just feels like, man, I haven't gone to the gym in like a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, that shirt's a little too constrictive. It's like that. Uh, Photoshop is, is like the, uh, you know, it, it becomes an extension of yourself because you get so used to working with it. You know what it does. Well, Painter could be the same thing for you if you spend enough time with it. I haven't, so for me, it's kind of like an old friend where it's like, uh, the same jokes aren't as funny. It's a little awkward. You know, some things are just inappropriate now because maybe he's changed a little bit. Maybe he's on version X3 and you're kind of like, you're still talking to him like he's version X1, you know, 11 or whatever. And uh, and he's like, yeah, dude, that's that's not going to work for me. You're like, well, wait a minute, dude. Like, where's my old old style watercolor? And he's like, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I got this whole new thing going on. And you're like, well, wait a minute. But I like how you worked before. It was so it was so efficient, and I understood it, and it made sense to me. But you know, it's just kind of like too bad. You know, you got to deal with that anyway. So you got to keep up with your buds. You got to keep up with your old friends. And uh, hey, this is me, kind of like trying to keep up with my old my old buddy painter, uh, giving him a little call, little uh, you know, a little call out. Hey, buddy, I need your magic. <laughs> I like a lot of what painter does because it feels like natural media. I am, I am jamming with the digital watercolor brush. That's pretty much all you've seen me use since I switched to Painter. Um, it's sloppy. Painter likes to push you to use fat brush strokes, which is against my natural tendencies. You know, I drew highly, highly detailed comic books for Marvel for a period of time, and uh, like I said before, spending sometimes twelve hours on a on a page just penciling. And, uh, and, and, and getting into the really nitty gritty details. So it's, it's counterintuitive for me to try to work with big fat brushes. But Painter is just kind of like, yeah, you, you know, that's just how I operate. I'm not really good with tiny little brushes, you know. Um, here I'm adding little hits of highlight uh, for the, the edge. And by the way, I, I'm terrible at this. I'm still learning a lot uh, about color theory and, and how light works. But uh, one of my observations is you get a lot more bounced light going on in the shadow areas. So you get color cords and, and all kinds of um, different uh, bounce color because the spectrum breaks apart more in the shadow areas. And uh, there's usually less detail in the shadow areas too. Um, I think ultimately I changed... You're going to see me make a lot of mistakes with this area. Specifically color is... Uh, it's still a challenge for me. I think it'll always be a challenge for me. Uh, well, no, I don't want to say that, but certainly, like, I haven't addressed that as directly as I've addressed 
uh, other things, and that's specifically because I seldom get to use it. In my job, I do concept art that's mostly line art, um, you know, designs, blueprints. Uh, so working with color is a bit of a challenge for me. Um, you know, finding colors that work well together. Uh, that's one thing I love about painters specifically is that the color blending works so well. Uh, it's just creamy, you know. Uh, I love the creamy feel of the way that a blender will just smush a color into another color. Um, there's also things like uh, the there's a, a, some of the effects tools such as the uh, the burn tool. I forget what it's called. It's like a, it's a it's the magic wand. If you look at my custom toolkit, that's my old 2012 custom toolkit. But there's some droid brushes in there. If you guys are familiar with Andrew Jones. I uh, use some of his. There's some selection tools and some effects tools. Mostly I'm using chalk. Uh, I think that the current, yeah, the current one for some of the line work that I'm doing is like a smudge brush. And painter's smudge brushes are awesome. Oh man, it feels so good. It's just like working on paper, only with all the benefits of the digital. And, uh, and you can see how it's breaking apart the lines the same way that it would if you were on a canvas or on a, in a sketch pad and just like kind of smudging and smearing. Um, I know some artists actually they put down color and then they just use smudge brushes and if they switch to painter I can only imagine how awesome like their their pieces would look almost like they're on a canvas you know what I mean um, and and maybe that's a you know that's a technique or a, something that I'll adopt later in this piece possibly. I'm not sure yet. I'm using that uh, that effects brush right now. Uh, it's a glow brush is what it's called. But anyway, I'm using that on the line art beneath, uh, you know, to kind of hotten up the, that line. Uh, it's going to react, the effects brush is going to react differently to the digital watercolor as it will to the underlying line art. And uh, the benefit of that is that it's, it's essentially adding color to your lines, you know? Um, that's how a lot of those guys uh, you'll see in some anime and, or manga kind of illustration. Uh, some of those guys, that's how they're getting that effect. Very common, actually, uh, these days. It, and what it is, it's basically just the, it's the hot spot where, uh, where, where uh, the spectrum is, is breaking apart and you're getting the most bounce light directly towards your eye is what's happening with that. And uh, by no means am I the best person to ask about color theory. Please don't ask. There are other guys, um, and I might just add some links to some other sites, you know, in the in the the, the text field below the video afterwards. Uh, here I'm kind of adding in some highlights and dropping in some shadows on the hair. I want to keep the hair feeling like it's like it's bouncing some light around. I want to keep some uh, some some of that greenish blue in the shadow areas. I'm trying to keep all of my shadows really cool and all of my uh, my lit areas kind of warm. Um, but you've got some subsurface scattering, and what that is is it's when light enters into a surface such as skin, and it actually increases the saturation because the blood underneath or whatever is underneath the skin within the skin is going to refract and bounce all of the, that same color around a lot more and so it intensifies the color that's why you get really uh, you'll notice if you look at like your finger uh, through really strong light or somebody's ear in the sunlight you'll notice it gets kind of like warm red um, what that is that's that's um, that's about light bouncing around inside of the uh, of, of the of the skin and that's called subsurface scattering subsurface as in within the surface and then the light scattering around um, a lot of you probably already know that but uh, this these videos are intended to be for people of all different levels whether you're learning or you're just interested in in art or you're looking to I don't know, pick up some new techniques or tricks or whatever <clears throat> Sometimes I also just kind of do a really sped up version for people who have no interest in the details of how it comes together. They just want to see the the magic of a piece starting from nothing and 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 reaching finished. Most of those people have probably already stopped watching by now. <laughs> We're well into almost 25 minutes on this one. 
Uh, some people have requested that I do longer videos, and this this one is for you guys. You know, this is going to be a long piece. Uh, I'm technically speaking, I haven't even really begun on the background elements that I really want to add yet. Um, so there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot that I'd like to cover and uh, I'd like to go into even further detail in some of the later episodes uh, but for now uh, here we are kind of blocking in some of the metal painters really cool at uh, making uh, metals uh, you know specifically with the glow brush you can get some really cool hot spots and um, you know it's not quite like using dodge and burn or uh, or a uh, vivid light uh, techniques in, in Photoshop it handles things slightly differently. And so here I'm kind of blocking in a little bit of the more lit areas and uh, pushing back some of the shadows just slightly a little bit. Um, in Painter, you know, sometimes you got multiple layers going on and the watercolor effect will only work on the same layer as, well, the base layer. The digital watercolor effect won't work on other layers on top of that. Um, and, you know, here's another kind of a trick that I use sometimes where I'll take a heavily textured uh, brush, and I think it's a chalk brush, or, oh, it's still the digital watercolor brush, but I'll blow it up really large, and then I'll kind of lay in very large shadowed areas or, or effect areas if, if it's um, kind of an ambient light or something like that hitting it and uh, somewhat disregard some of my details and let the, let the uh, algorithms within the program calculate some of the color blending, you know? You don't need to actually do all that yourself, um, as opposed to working, if you were working with oils or, or something of that nature and traditional mediums. Uh, this foot was really difficult for me for some reason. I think I was, I was referencing some watercolor imagery uh, and the core shadow and, and where the, the light was hitting the, the edge was very warm, but I wanted it to feel like a, a cool metal. I didn't want to pull too much attention to this, this foot overall. Uh, so I worked it and I reworked it and I reworked it. And this is kind of like what I was talking about before where you're going to see me make a lot of mistakes with this one. Um, as I said, uh, painting uh, with color isn't, isn't really my strength, but you know, it's good to keep, keep practicing, you know, uh, and sometimes you just have to keep working at something, you know, and keep trying to figure it out. You know, sometimes the, the answer is within just exploring, you know, um, it's looking too painted to me at this stage. Um, that's why I'm kind of switching on some layers, switching off layers, going back in with some cool, uh, cool blues, you know, that sort of a thing. And you'll notice I'm kind of dancing around all over the whole image. That's because I'm working the, out the whole piece in, as, in its entirety. Uh, adding in little rim lighting, that's where the object gets kind of placed more into the setting a little bit more. Uh, that's what you're seeing around those little edges where it's, it's white. If, the, if you were against a different color background, um, you know, that light, depending on how reflective that surface would be, would be uh, affecting that edge a little bit more. Um, I'm trying to play down some of these background elements because I don't want them to contrast or stand out too much from the face uh, or from the focal point of the image. Uh, specifically, like you'll notice even the warmest areas of, of the shot are around his face, you know, the highest points of contrast and yellow and, and, and heat. Um, although later all that stuff is going to get addressed uh, again with a uh, overall color pass in Photoshop. Yes, we will be jumping back into Photoshop. Um, and so here I am adding in some more of the rim light around the, uh, the belt. Here we go. We're back in Photoshop and we're doing some color adjusting. This is a color balance layer and I'm looking for something. It's easy to get seduced by this because yes, it just looks striking like to see what you've been making progress on in a different way and you're affecting everything across the board you know um, it's not just one color or anything like that you're you're affecting the color harmonies you're affecting how colors are going to relate to each other uh, what's the overall feel of the piece you know once we've settled on something like that at least for now we're going to dive in a little bit more into some of the details i really want to go detail crazy with this piece because 
I can afford to. Uh, there's no deadline on Twilight Monk right now. I'm totally free. And the beauty of that is that I get to make it as awesome as I want. I can spend as much time as I want on it. And, uh, you know, Twilight Monk readers are just going to have to wait. Sorry. Sorry, buds. But it's it's uh it's it's for your own good. No, it's for the good of the <laughs> it's for the good of the book. And, and um, you know, I, I, this was a period of time where I set out to, to grow a little bit. This is a period of time where I set out to set a new standard for myself. And uh, I'm actually pleased that I, I chose to record this one because I, I feel like I learned a lot doing this one. You know, and you should be learning something with every piece that you do. If you're not, then you might be uh, doing something wrong, you know. Um, and believe me when I say it, I have a long way to go. There's so many things that I want to develop and so many ways that I want to improve. Uh, here with the metal, I'm creating a multiply layer so that I can back a few elements off. Uh, I think I'm going to address a little bit of that chaos back there. I want to keep it loose and still have energy, but I want it to be cleaned up and not feel like just scribbles, you know. It should make sense to some extent. Uh, this is a weird design, this kind of a skull uh, uh, wrapped around, or it's got like little ropes wrapped around it. I just imagine that it would be one of the trinkets that he would have picked up. Um, probably not a real skull. Um, you can see my, I accidentally hit the Intuos buttons and it pops up a user interface thing sometimes. Um, but yes, the, the skull thing, I'm not imagining like a real human skull. That's pretty gruesome, you know. But uh, certainly like a trinkety kind of maybe like a, a small uh, m metallic uh, kind of a skull-like uh, thing that, that would have twine wrapped through it. There's like little candies in there. No, they're not, <laughs> they're not candies. They look like it though, don't they? Um, these rings, I do have a story in mind for what I want them to be, but I'm not going to address that in this or anything soon. Um, there are a number of stories that I want to tell with the characters, and I'm really a little too slow at drawing to be able to do them all, which is why I'm, I'm actually putting together some content written in prose right now. Uh, there's, there's a lot of new types of projects that I'm, I'm developing with Twilight Monk right now, um, but I'm spread pretty thin with a lot of different projects. Uh, there's going to be some really awesome announcements happening soon. I'm working with some very talented people to make a, uh, a project that I won't go too much into detail just yet, but you'll hear about it when the time is right. Uh, here I'm backing off the saturation specifically on that uh, uh, background uh, um, cloth that's that's flowing. It's mostly there just for energy, but that doesn't mean that it, it shouldn't be worked out to some extent. And uh, Generally speaking, as a rule, the less contrast you have, the more it's going to feel like it's background. So, for instance, you know, uh, that's why you'll notice with Chris Bacallo's work, if you're familiar with him, he's a Marvel artist. Uh, he does a lot of heavy blacks in, in his uh, artwork, and his colorists, and, and I believe he colors himself uh, a lot more recently, but uh, they always back off a lot of the line work because it will require... It requires that in order to make the foreground elements read clearly. So the background elements, if you knock out the line art um, and you just fill it in with lighter color uh, or lower contrast, then you're going to, it'll immediately push it behind the character. And you'll see me do this a lot throughout the whole piece. It's not as um, structured as it probably could be uh, to communicate that. Um, you know, because I'm not just doing it one pass that does it. Here I'm doing it some more. This is what I mean by knocking out the line art. Um, you'll notice how now that feels very definitively like it's more background than foreground. Um, and the elements that are foreground have a stronger contrast or a stronger outline. Um, and to some extent, that's why I tend to sometimes do a thick outline around a focal point or around a character's uh, uh, point of interest on him, if it's his face or hair or whatever. Uh, here I'm getting into the details of turning the form a little bit on some of the knickknacks and patty wax and all that stuff in his uh, in his ropes. Uh, adding in some shadows, the finer details, uh, they're all very subtle because I don't want to pull away from uh, the larger elements. I love how the reflective metal or the, the little hits of highlight on that metal are, are turning out there. 
um, adding in some more shadows, backing off the ropes a little bit more, blending it into the background just a little bit more. I don't want to pull too much attention to it. Here I'm hitting in some strong rim lighting on the metallic or reflective surfaces, which really turns the form a lot more. And I was actually really pleased with how much more that pops now. And you'll see me, you'll see me doing that on certain surfaces here and there. Here I'm feeling weird about that dagger, but I'm not ready to address it yet. I'll come back to that. Hitting on little chunks of metal here and there, making that uh, back arm feel a little bit more clear, just slightly, but keeping it still keeping it very low contrast so that it doesn't grab your eye too much. Here's a this is a stage where I'm really just kind of dancing all around, looking at which materials are reflective, looking at um, you know which little little details could use a little bit of love to uh, to keep the eye popping around when the viewer looks at the image there should be a lot to a lot of interesting elements to, to check out and and you know the, ideally you would want your image to read immediately as very cool and then give the viewer neat little stuff to to look at within that um, that's a very Ketsuya Tarada kind of an approach and, and I I love that guy's work. I don't know. You could probably see the influence in this piece if you're, if you're also a fan of Ketsuya Tarada's work. Um, although he's a lot darker than me, he does some weird stuff that I just <laughs> I don't think I would ever. He goes into a realm that I, I don't think I would dare go. Um, my work, I think, is a, is a lot more um, playful and. Um, all ages <laughs> some of his work is not um, but I love that stuff too it, uh, I, I I like his technique a lot uh, here I'm, I'm kind of popping in a little bit of highlights and, and maybe that's too strong I might actually back that off a little bit more later uh, on the the rope because rope shouldn't be that reflective um, I needed I felt like it needed to turn the form just a little bit more but not as much as I had done it so backing that off again see there you go um, we've got our shadows darkened up a lot more. We're getting into some more of the rim lighting and, uh, you know, here and there, little details, tiny little details. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a multi-part video series. We're coming up on about 36 minutes here, 37 minutes. Uh, I'm nowhere near done with this one. Uh, this is going to be the craziest piece I've done in a while. And I really hope you guys stick around for the ride because, uh, I'm going to probably, I know I'll do a, at least one more. Uh, I have some plans for a background element that I want to add, and we're going to address that with the next one. Um, and it might just keep going. Uh, you know, it depends on how crazy that stuff gets. Uh, if you want to check this stuff out, if you really like these videos, please comment. I want to know what you guys think. I want to know what you want to see. I want to know what you want to talk about, what you want to hear about. Uh, if it's old stories, if it's about more details about the tools themselves. Please subscribe, and I will see you guys, hopefully, in part two. If you have the endurance, the fortitude, the strength, the inner gusto to stick with me on this one, I will see you there. Yeah.